Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, opponents line up against the nine council districts for Montgomery County movement. There are two major state ballot initiatives that you will want to know about. Will Senate Democrats block the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court and prize fight or debate? Who came out on top in Tuesday's presidential face-off? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the four. We are joined by former County Council member Mike Knapp. Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Unkefer, former membership director of the Maryland GOP, Phil Bell, and political strategist, Susan Heltmus. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Ballot questions rarely quicken the pulse of most Montgomery County voters. This year, however, there are competing proposals which seek to change the makeup of the County Council. Question C would expand the number of council members from nine to 11 and increase the number of councilmanic districts from five to seven. Question D, however, would keep the same number of council members, but change the makeup of the County Council by creating nine distinct council districts instead of the current four at large and five council districts. Here to address the question is Marilyn Balcom, co-chair of ballot committee residents for more representation and a past candidate for Montgomery County Council at large. Welcome Marilyn. Hi, how are you? Marilyn, tell, us, tell us about your group and, and what you're hoping to achieve. Sure, so um, the ballot questions are very important. Uh, basically, we're, uh, they're looking at changing the, go the government structure for Montgomery County. So our ballot question is, is 4C. We think that expanding the districts to seven districts plus at large makes the most sense. And we are against D, we are against nine specific districts. Uh, we feel strongly that the at large play a critical role in our government. So having two questions so very similar on the ballot, isn't it confusing as to which is which and which is better for the council, I mean, for the county? It's, it is very confusing. And, and uh, it seems like everybody and their brother is out there trying to educate on the ballot questions. Um, and uh, yes, it, it is confusing. And, and we're, that's, that's why we've been involved, is to try to make it clear what the better choice is, uh, particularly for the up county. So, I mean, one of the things that is, is discussed, you know, constantly is the fact that uh, the county council members don't seem connected to the citizens of, Mon of Montgomery County. I mean, I'm in District 1 and Andrew Friedson's a nice guy, but if I hadn't seen him at you know, B uh, Bethesda Chamber of Commerce meetings, uh, he, I, would, I don't know if, he know if he's ever been outside the Beltway. How is adding two more council members going to improve governance? So you make a good point about representation, right? So one of the reasons for the additional two council members is that the county has grown significantly, 50% since the, the, since the charter established the nine members. Uh, so what two additional members does is that it reduces the number of constituents per district. And I think that you'll find that those council districts will, will be smaller and um, address constituent issues, which is separate and apart from the necessary, um, the need for the at-large districts. Well, but it also adds increased cost to, for the county council because each county council member will have staff and mm -hmm. will, and is that really necessary? I think so. We need to look at, we're, we're a growing county. We're over a million people and we haven't changed our government uh, since, I guess, 1986. So um, yeah, we do need to invest. We need to invest in our government just like we invest in, in the rest of our infrastructure. Uh, Kim Prasad, the chairperson of nine districts for Montgomery County, appeared on this show two weeks ago and describe question D as an effort to provide greater representation for upper Montgomery County residents. You touched on that as part of the reason to vote for question C. 
why is your proposal better than question D? So the problem with question D is that it promises more representation in the up county. And there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. In fact, the opposite's true. So right now, we have three of the five districts represented in the up, up county. Um, when, if, we, if there are nine districts, we're not going to get more districts. Um, the balance of power is not going to change. And so if the up county got an extra district, so will Silver Spring, and so will Bethesda, and so will Rockville. The districts will be based on the census, not, not the nine districts hope and a prayer. Um, well, if it's based on the demographics, isn't that the same fatal flaw in your proposal that adding two more seats won't, will just add another seat to Silver Spring or add another seat to uh, Rockville, Bethesda? No. The, the, well, first off, all the districts are going to be re re redrawn for the, based on the census. And so the at-large members play a pivotal role in government. Every, every voter has five votes for the council. The nine districts take away four of those votes. It, it, it is not additional representation. It is less representation if you take away four of my votes. Well, you probably face this when you, when you ran, uh, when you ran at large. Running at large means you have to get a plurality of 655,000 voters. Isn't this discriminatory to, to new candidates and minority candidates who have to try to run in an at-large setting? Um, no, I think the, the um, uh, public finance has helped that immensely. But when I ran at large, I really valued what at large members do. They have a broad knowledge of the entire county. Somebody who's watching out for the county as a whole. The districts don't do that. And I think that eliminating the at large will, will narrow the focus of the council, not broaden the focus of the council. Well, thank you, Marilyn. That's, that's a great explanation and a great distinction between the, between the two different uh, questions on the ballot. And we'll see in, in a couple of weeks how the voter, what the voters decide. When we come back from this short break, who won the heavyweight slugfest between President Donald Trump and challenger Joseph R. Biden? Stay tuned. And welcome back. The state of Maryland is one of a handful of states that restricts the ability of the legislature to add or reapportion expenditures to the budget proposal submitted by its governor. Maryland question one this year would authorize the General Assembly the ability to increase, decrease, or add items to the state budget as long as the changes do not make the budget exceed the total proposed budget that has been submitted by the governor. Follow that if you can. Susan, proponents say that this is about balancing the state budget and allows the legislature greater responsibility in the budget process. Um, it, it's interesting, Maryland, I think, may be the only state that puts all of the power of the budget to um, the governor. And the only thing that can be done is you can delete from the budget, and but you can't add. So I think this is a decent proposal that gives the legislative body some ability to switch things around, add things, take away, as long as it stays within the figures that the governor puts forth. When you think about Congress, the budget starts in the House. And so this is a logical thing, and I think it will be useful to all governors and legislators in the future. Well, I, th I don't think the analogy of what starts in the, in the House in the U.S. Congress. But across you know, the country, that's, that's, really that's the usual. Point here, Susan, it's a question of whether or not the balance of power will be shifted dramatically by this, this uh, piece of. It, it's uh, minor, power. only that they can work only within the structure. And it makes sense that they should be able to switch things around. So I think, I think it's a good compromise. You know, the governor, and this has been talked about for decades, Casey, that this time has come to change this. Well, let's, let me move on to Mark, because opponents say, Mark, that it isn't about a balanced budget at all, but it's really about transferring budgetary power from the governor, and they call it a backdoor power grab, is it? 
Well, let's, yes, it is a backdoor power grab. Let's start with the fact that we have a balanced budget in Maryland, so this isn't something to get us to that point. Uh, the history is worth taking a look at, which is the reason we have this uh, provision in the Constitution has been when the legislature has overspent and created financial crisis uh, that caused, uh, how shall I say, cooler minds to recognize that there needed to be more restraint. Uh, this is not as balanced as Susan describes it. For example, we don't have a, a line item veto, which would be a, a, something to uh, include with this in order to have that much more constraint. Uh, anybody looking at the history of, uh, say, the Thornton Commission recommendations and the latest with Kerwin has got to recognize the tendency of the legislature to take on uh, spending commitments uh, into the future uh, that can uh, wreak havoc down the road. Now, look, I don't. I want to uh, give everybody a chance to weigh in on this, but I do want to. We have limited time here, so I want to talk about the second ballot question, which deals with sports betting and would allow wagering at sporting events. Phil, like previous gambling initiatives, the revenue would be earmarked to fund higher educate or education. So, how can you argue with that? Well, it's easy because if every time you have an initiative like this, what we always end up with is whatever the subject is becoming dependent on that source of revenue. Take a look at Atlantic City. Atlantic City used to have great casinos that did a lot of revenue. Then you had casinos open up in other places. Suddenly that revenue plummeted. What's gonna happen now if education, whatever you know definition you're using of that, starts to become dependent and later on, the revenue evaporates because other states start to join in. Mike, we only have about a minute, so I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, the idea that funding our education through gambling has always seemed like a, the wrong approach since gambling has its own negative side of broken homes and lives. So is this the best way to finance our education? Well, it's not the best way to finance our education. And, and I think one of the things that often gets ignored is that unfortunately we assume that we're adding to the education budget that already exists with, this, with these additional gambling revenues. And the reality is that oftentimes, and particularly in Maryland, we're supplanting those dollars. So we're just taking the dollars that we're going to education, moving to other things, and then putting in the gambling dollars. And so the reality is we're not actually investing any more in education as a result of this. And what I think we need to do is if we're actually gonna focus on that, then let's increase our resources and actually use those dollars to enhance what we're doing in education, not just move the money around. Well, that, that's an interesting idea, especially since we're probably looking at huge budget shortfalls because of the, uh, effect of the coronavirus recession that we've all encountered. Let's go on to a more national topic for right now. And the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has given President Trump <clears throat> the opportunity to place a third Supreme Court justice on the Supreme Court during his term in office. Next week, the Judiciary Committee of the Senate will hold confirmation hearings for President Trump's nominee, Court of Appeals Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Mike, Democrats waged an all-out bruising assault on the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh in 2018, and as a result, lost at least two seats in the process. Will Democrats approach the nomination of Judge Barrett differently? I think they will. I think it'll be different because, first of all, she doesn't have anywhere near the personal baggage that he did as a nominee. And also, prior to any true vetting of, of, of her as a nominee in the Senate, a, a majority of the Republicans, the majority of the Senate, have already lined up and said they're going to vote for her. So, and they have their right to do so, but it's not very good policy. So they've already said that's what who's going to get approved. And so as a, as a Democratic legislature, there's not a lot left to kind of do except make some noise if you want to. And I don't think that they will. I think the really unfortunate thing, though, is that this just continues to cast a further pall on the Senate, where it's really clear that under Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham, truth, consistency, decency are just qualities that they really no longer value or required or quite honestly even considered in the Senate anymore. <laughs> Uh, Mark, it's been suggested that Judge Barrett's Catholic faith has disqualifies her from being on the Supreme Court, finding ironically that it was 60 years ago today, that Senator, 60 years ago, excuse me, not today, it was September 12th, that, that Senator John Fitzgerald Kennedy addressed the question of whether his Catholic faith would allow him to make important national decisions independent of the church. Is it, why is this still an issue 60 years later? You know, it really is, this is a reference back to when she was confirmed as a, uh, a court of appeals judge. And there was really an ugly moment where Senator Feinstein made a reference to whether the, quote, dogma lived within her. And it was a reference to her Catholic phrase. 
faith. I would have hoped, apparently not, that we have come a long way from when there was a notion that there was a, quote, Jewish seat and a, quote, Catholic seat on the Supreme Court. As recently as the 80s, uh, Justice Brennan was in the, quote, Catholic seat. Um, that's an unfortunate, uh, and I think right now we really need to move forward and look for the best qualified judge and to recognize that really judges respond to the law. They're not somebody who are there as sort of super policy makers who kind of make their choices based on their individual personal preferences. Um, Casey, so, I'd like to I interject wanna... here. Um, I'm a Catholic and I look at the makeup of the Supreme Court at the moment. Um, with the death of Justice Ginsburg, five of the current uh, uh, members of the Supreme Court are Catholic. It would be six if you counted Gorsuch because he was raised Catholic but is an Episcopalian now. And the problem that a lot of people have with this nominee is that she is affiliated with a group called the People of Praise. And within the last couple of days, they just scoured everything off of their website. But that website does two things. It says that she is anti-abortion, and she has said that she's anti-abortion. And secondly, this group also holds that men are divinely ordained to be the head of the family and the head of the church. I think that with Roe versus Wade, this is a real issue that Democrats should take up. And there is no problem on the Supreme Court, Casey, about Catholics, because it will be 66% if she gets in. And if you call Gorsuch still a Catholic, that's 78%. Well, People you, should be out there you, saying, wait a minute. When he doesn't call himself a Catholic. But, but I, well, I, I, would, I would like to point out, Susan, that, the, uh, that Article 6 of the Constitution in its third clause has what they call the, relig the no religious test uh, uh, That's right. clause, which prohibits a, a nominee for any uh, federal post from being uh, judged by their religious background. I'm just and saying hey, that is, you brought up John F. Kennedy. I just wanted to respond to that with these numbers. That's well, not an issue. Hey, hey, let's get still and we have 30 seconds. Yeah, here. you know what? It, this just is another example of the hypocrisy that the left shows with respect to religion. When Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi talk about their faith, it's great. But if it's Amy Coney Barrett, oh my gosh, we have to get into the minutia of a group that no one's ever heard of. Thank you, Phil. All right, now it's time for our, our the most fun portion of our, our show each week. It's called the political weather vane. And, and we're gonna start with the first of three scheduled presidential debates was held on Tuesday. Who won and who lost? And Mike Knapp, you have the privilege of starting off. Excellent. Well, I think the voters and the concept of open discourse lost. Uh, clearly, the notion of debates has been changing with the growing fields in the primaries um, and candidates really just trying to get sound bites in. And so there really hasn't been much of a debate. But this first presidential debate looked like a, a bad Jerry Springer episode. And unfortunately, it was pretty clear that was Trump's plan. Um, and so I, I think that we lost because there really wasn't any discussion. And I think that I am hopeful that we'll come up with a mechanism, a mechanism that allows us to be able to have one person speak at one time so we can actually hear what they're saying and make some, some decision from that. Mike, I have to profoundly Bill, Bill, disagree you're, you're, with that. You're next. Completely. Yeah. You know what? First of all, we should be very excited. We live in a country where we can have and express our opinions in such an enthusiastic way. That was one of the best opportunities that you could hear from two different people. Unfortunately, the debate consisted of three people with Chris Wallace playing much too much of a role. He should have shut up, to use Joe Biden's words, and let the candidates actually discuss the issues that they wanted to bring about. And what really, and so it's needless to say, I do believe that President Trump won, beating both of them. But what is really worrying me is that you have this commission trying to say that they're going to insert themselves even more greatly into that discourse. We, what they say matters at the ballot box, but not on the stage. Susan Altimus, uh, your, your turn at the 
political weather vane. Okay, um, I think Joe Biden was the winner. There were 92 interruptions in quote unquote civil conversation. 71 of those disruptions came away from Donald Trump. And if you listen to what he said, in four years he didn't learn anything because I saw an analysis of what he said then versus what he said four years ago. No more substance, nothing else. And I am grateful that they are going to be able to shut the mic off. There was one instance when Joe Biden had the first question and Donald Trump talked through the whole thing and he never got to speak. So yay for the commission, shut off the mic. <laughs> I wish I had that authority too. <laughs> Not with me, Mark, you don't. Mark Uncle, four years, years ago. The political weather vane. Sure, four years ago, Donald Trump was elected to be a disruptor, a disruptor between both political parties. Uh, and uh, I think he demonstrated uh, at the debate that he continues to be a disruptor. Uh, probably the good thing for him was that he didn't have a, as an opponent uh, one of the women candidates because then he would have been accused of mansplaining. Uh, Donald Trump did what Donald Trump did, does, and uh, we saw it in force on, on, uh, on Tuesday night. Thank you, Mark. You know, there's a, uh, hypocrisy is used a lot by uh, both sides. The, of the political spectrum. And I want to I wanted to say that nobody on this panel is hypocritical. They're true to form <laughs> because you know, the Democrats say one thing and the Republicans say the other. And, and there's there's no change there. It's a wonderful thing to say that there is consistency and also civility on 21 this week. Stay tuned for party shots. And welcome back. Now with Party Shots, Mike Knapp. Thanks. I just want to shout out to uh, Stu Edelstein, who has been the head of the University of Shady Grove for the last 18 years. He showed up as the executive director there in 2002, and there were roughly 400 students. He's, he's now retiring. There are 3,000 students. There are 80 degree granting programs from nine universities from across the state system and a budget of about $20 million with 100 employees and the highest success rate and the high, greatest level of diversity of any regional higher education center or, system or school within the university system. And that's primarily as a result of Stu's efforts. So we wish him Godspeed and thank him for his efforts. Thank you, Mike. Phil Bell, your parting shot. Thanks, Casey. My parting shot's about something that I've talked about a lot, my favorite baseball team, the New York Mets. Uh, though maybe I should say was my favorite baseball team because in early September, they walked off the field of the Florida Marlins to protest systemic racism. Never mind that they have at the front of their stadium the Jackie Robinson Rotunda, which honors someone who protested racism by playing baseball. I'm profoundly upset with that team. It's no surprise that they didn't win anything again. And so, yeah, my parting shot goes out to you, the orange and blue. Thank you, uh, Phil. Susan Heltvis, your parting shot. Um. I grew up in Minnesota and my neighboring state of Wisconsin is going through a terrible time with the COVID virus. In parts of the state like La Crosse and Green Bay, their positivity rate is 26, 27%. And in fact, in several hospitals in Wisconsin, you have to reserve a bed now because the COVID virus is so serious. In fact, the White House sent a letter to La Crosse and Green Bay saying, you got to get your act together. This is dangerous. So what does President Trump announce this weekend? He's having a rally in La Crosse and Green Bay. Nothing left to say. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Mark for your party shot. Well, normally one of the better members of the county council, Andrew Friesen, has proposed some new ethics rules, which I think need uh, some additional consideration. Uh, one of the provisions to it is one that would prohibit uh, county employees, the ones affected by these regulations, from writing books. Uh, this is a movie that we've seen before. It was actually the DC Sniper 23 Days of Fear movie, which was the the movie based on the book by police chief Charles Moose. I think we need less broad based restrictions, more focused on the job of the employee, of the employee rather than this blanket prohibition. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank the panel for engaging in a lively and entertaining uh, discussion today. And I, and I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show, 
for 21 this week. I'm Casey Aiken.